Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 167. Thank you so much for joining me here. Um, boy, has it been a busy month already for me. I hope uh, you're finding some time to squeeze in some genealogy research. Um, we've been doing a little bit of adding to the family tree lately, but not through genealogical research, actually through a marriage. If you're on the Genealogy Gems newsletter list, you saw that my youngest daughter, Hannah, was getting married. And that wonderful union happened last weekend uh, out in Florida. Their dream wedding was to be on the beach. And what a nice place to get married. It was absolutely gorgeous. Now we were over on the Panhandle side of Florida. And everybody who worked at this hotel we were staying at was saying, Oh, my gosh, we just had 20 inches of rain. And you could see the water that's normally this gorgeous emerald color was kind of dark and churned up. But when we got there, the sun came out, it was glorious. They said it was the best weather they had had, had in, in months. So that worked out pretty well. And uh, the couple is very happy. Uh, Hannah married Ryan. And uh, we had a, just a small intimate wedding on the beach. And boy, it was so cute. Davy walked down the aisle. Now Davy's four now. Can you believe it? And my grandson, and he was wearing around his neck a little sign that says, here comes the bride. <laughs> it was so cute. And uh, he hung in there. And, and Joey, too, who is not even quite two years old yet, uh, he had his sippy cup, so he was happy. So it was great. And um, But a whirlwind, considering I had been at the National Genealogical Society Conference the week before. And as I was at the conference, everybody kept saying, Oh, so how's it going? I said, well, my daughter's getting married next weekend. And they were looking at me like, you're here and your hair isn't turning white as we speak. Um, I, I know it was a lot going on. There was no way around it. I mean, we book conferences as far in advance as you book weddings. And um, thankfully, there was time for both. So yes, I was at the NGS conference and I met many of you there. And welcome to all of you new listeners. Wow, we just saw tons and tons of people I had heard they were saying they thought they had about a total of 2,500 people there over the four-day conference. That's a huge turnout. Um, I don't know if that's a record for NGS, but boy, that is a fantastic turnout. And the energy reminded me a little bit of Jamboree. If you've ever been to the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree, then you know it's kind of a party atmosphere and it's fun and everybody's just up and excited. It just has a different kind of feel to it. And I really felt like um, the NGS conference this year in Richmond, Virginia, had that same feel. There was a ton of energy. I think there were a lot of new people there as well. And everybody was just psyched to be there. So we had a great time. And we did something really different this year. In the past, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show before, but, you know, as a speaker, they approach you to, to do different presentations. And a lot of times that's not always totally within your control, which sessions you're going to do. And, and certainly as somebody who's, you know, written books and has favorite topics, you know, they're things I would love to share with people. And if those don't make the schedule, then that's kind of your chance. So I was kind of racking my brain thinking, you know, how can we get more out to people and give them some alternatives? How do we get outside the, the typical conference box and got my head together with Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, and Janet Havorka, my friend over at Family Chart Masters. And we got to brainstorming and said, you know, maybe we three ladies ought to pull together and create kind of a little mini conference at a conference. And, and it wasn't a conference. It was, we called it Genealogy Outside the Box. And these were quick 30 minute sessions held in our, our area where we actually put our booths together. And, and this was kind of a radical idea, but a lot of vendors came up to us and said, wow, this is so cool. We we got there and we tore down the wall between us. You know, normally there would be pipe and drape uh, that separates and kind of gives you a little bit of a curtain wall between each booth. And we just took that stuff down. And we ended up with a block of four booths all together, wide open. We rented some chairs, brought them in. 
um, set up a projection screen and projector and created our own little haven, if you will, in the exhibit hall. And I hope if you were at NGS, you got a chance to come by because we had a blast. We did about 11 mini sessions, outside the box sessions. There were probably about uh, three a day and a wide variety of topics because Maureen and Janet and I all cover very different areas of family history. And everybody who attended got a chance to, to come and hang out. If they wanted to stand and stretch their legs, they could stand and watch the presentation because they've been sitting in these hour long lectures, you know, back to back. And then we put together an ebook of all of the handouts. So for all the sessions, regardless of which one you attended, we created our own little outside the box ebook. And it was packed full of all the tips and tricks that we shared during those sessions. And don't worry if you weren't at NGS and you missed that because we're bringing it to future conferences. And the next one coming up is FGS, the Federation of Genealogical Societies. That uh, national conference will be in San Antonio in August uh, 2014. And certainly, if you're listening to this into the future, we know we all come at different times and listen to these episodes. Um, we will certainly be at other locations as well. It was a roaring success, and we had a fabulous time. And we are all committed to uh, doing more of these in the future because it just provides another alternative. If, if I've learned anything doing the podcast, it's everybody learns differently. And that's why here at Genealogy Gems, we do written word, as in blogs. We do, uh, you know, show notes. We do the audio, which is the podcast. We do tons of video. Uh, whether you like to watch it or listen to it or read it, there's something for you. And that was the goal with the outside the box sessions was to provide alternative ways to, to, uh, enjoy the conference experience. So had a great time. Gosh, I could go on and on about it, but I have so much to go on and on about in this episode because um, we have mailbox, yeah, some emails from you. We have Colonial America Research. I fully admit it. I know nothing <laughs> about this, mostly because it doesn't, it just really hasn't applied much to my family. I have a couple of lines that go back into colonial America. But you know, I tend to get focused on other things. I just haven't delved into that area. So I jumped to the chance when I met Beth Folk, who's a expert in colonial research, I met her up in, in Independence, Missouri, I was speaking at the Midcontinent Library there a couple of months ago. And we had dinner and she was sitting next to me and we just had this really interesting conversation. I said, Oh, my gosh, you got to come on the show, you got to share this not just with me, but with all of the listeners. And so she's here. And she's going to give you a great foundation in digging into your colonial research if you haven't taken on, that on yet. Uh, one more news item for you, though. This came from my friend Paul Nada over at Family Search. And uh, he knows I love newspapers. And I think at NGS, he was out there in the audience um, in the newspaper class. But he uh, sent me this little notice here. It says the National Library of Australia has added an additional 35 historic newspapers to their online collection. Now, if you're not familiar with the National Library of Australia, or you're thinking, well, I'm in the UK, or I'm in the US, what does that have to do with me? Well, it does, because their website and their collection is international. In fact, I wrote an article for Family Tree Magazine a couple of years back, and I was looking for kind of the top six, you know, repositories of old newspapers, particularly digitized online that were free. And this one absolutely rose to the top National Library of Australia. And you find it at trove, that's T R O V E dot N L A dot gov dot A U, put a slash in there and add a newspaper and you're going to go straight to the newspaper page. Well, the greatest concentration of newspapers in this latest update that they've done is from New South Wales. So if you have ancestors from there, this will be of particular interest. Uh, most of the new editions cover the date range from about 1875 to 1960. And a lot of those are in that 1910 to 1945 era. And good news, most of these appear to be from small towns. So often, you know, the small town folks, the rural folks, um, they're aren't sometimes there just isn't as much richness in terms of uh, records and things but newspapers of course in a small town they're talking about the locals and that's awesome so check that out and as i said 
even if you're not interested in this particular new edition, this is just a great place to go and do some searches to see if by chance, they have your part of the world and your ancestors because they have a wonderful collection. Okay, well, uh, coming up next, we're heading over to the mailbox to hear from you. to hear from you. And I really do read every single email. I'm not as quick to respond as I was seven years ago when this podcast began, but I do respond and I share as many as I can here on the show. If you want to send me an email, you can send it to genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Christine did that. And she wrote me a note says, I loved your comments on most treasure family relic in the latest podcast. I'm very fortunate to have pictures and artifacts from my mother's side, but unfortunately, I know very little about my dad's side, and I have only a few things. I could relate to the woman whose answer was nothing. One consolation for me has been a few little things I could find out with just a little bit of digging. And she says she wrote a blog about it. Good for you, Christine. It's at leaf, twig, and stem.blogspot.com. And I'll have the uh, direct link to that particular post, which is called Traces of the Past, uh, on, in the show notes here for episode 167. Chris says, uh, finding the things I mentioned at least lets me stand in the shoes of my ancestors and imagine life in that place and at that time. It's not as nice as a relic, but it brings them to life as real people. I think that's important in genealogy as well. So if you want to find out what she has uh, dug up, head over to leaftwigandstem.blogspot.com. And um, I did a legacy webinar, legacy family tree webinar, um, not too long ago here in 2014. And those are always fun, huge turnout. Oh my gosh, I think we had over a 1000 people. Um, Judy sent me an email right away. I think it was the next morning. And I always threaten people. I say, you know, we're going to do this. And I'm sorry, but you're going to lose sleep tonight because you're going to be up all night doing some of this cool stuff. And Judy did. She says, I was so excited about your workshop. And in this particular case, we were doing Google Earth for genealogy, one of my favorite topics. So uh, Judy writes in, she says, I was so excited about your workshop. Legacy presenters are good, but you are among the best. Thank you, Judy. That's very nice because you have some great presenters. She says, in fact, I received an email from my friend. And the email says, Howie, lay down. Can you hear Howie on my hardwood floors? It's like, I'm going to have to get him booties. (laughs) Yes, I see you. I'm going to have to get him booties because he's got these nails. And we now have hardwood floors here in Texas. And he's just a little pitter patter. Okay, go lay down. Okay, so she writes in this, uh, this email says, after watching today's webinar and seeing the gal search the GLO records for land patents, she's talking about the Bureau of Land Management, I tried for William Breeding. Score! It says in big, bold letters and lots of exclamation points. I had tried searching for land patents for William Breeding in the past with no success. My great results are due to finally getting confirmation that it is William Jackson Breeding for sure and watching this gal search today. I think I'm this gal. And so her friend says, thanks for the heads up on this webinar. 
and uh, you can watch the video on my website. Uh, it's not the exact legacy video, but it is the same presentation, and it is G- Google Earth for genealogy. It's a one-hour class, absolutely free. Go to genealogygems.com, uh, hover your mouse over video, and click on Google Earth for genealogy, and you'll see the same presentation I did for legacy, and maybe you will score, as <laughs> Judy's friend did. And here from Barbara in Australia, she says, I really enjoy your podcast. And I was listening to your latest one, when your piece about not so happy memories really struck a chord with me. I recently asked for the file of my great uncle from the Australian War Memorial. He was in World War One in France, I found that he had been charged with desertion and sent to jail. What a shock. And I don't think many of the family know a lot about it. Reading through the transcript of the court-martial and the history of this time of the war, it was pretty clear that he was a young man in shock after seeing several of his fellow soldiers die who did not know what to do. He got separated from his troop and he wandered around for a couple of days until he found another company and was arrested. Later he got TB and this probably shortened his life. A sad story, and during my research, I found that 306 Commonwealth soldiers were shot for desertion. It is quite a controversial part of our history as, thank goodness, the Australian Army refused to allow any of its soldiers to be executed, and this caused some issues with the English officers. A new law passed on November 8th of 2006 and included as part of the Armed Forces Act in the UK has pardoned men in the British and Commonwealth armies who were executed in World War I. The law removes the dishonor with regards to executions on war records, but it does not cancel out the sentence of death. I've decided not to put any of the information online, but keep it in the family archives. Anyone in the family who decides to go looking will find it at the war memorial site. But my uncle did not marry or have children, so that does seem to lessen the impact. Anyway, to a happier subject, she says, I wonder if I could ask you for some assistance when you get a few minutes spare on the podcast. I'm trying to track down the family of an Australian sailor from World War I who wrote some lovely postcards. Okay, everybody get your thinking caps on. She's got a task for us. She says, I bought them at a garage sale several years ago, and I have only just got around to reading them. I would really love to give them to the family as they are very touching. She says that she wrote a blog post about this, so I will have a link in the show notes uh, to get you specifically to it. Her blog is barbs01.blogspot.com.au, and the post is called A Peek Into Past and Very Touching Story. Uh, If you'd like to know a little bit more, uh, head to the show notes, 167, and click the link and check that out. So she says, here's what I know from them. These are from these letters. The writer was on board the SS, um, I'll spell it, G-I-L-G-A-I, Gilgay, in December 1915 to February 1916, traveling from St. Vincent, Cape Verde, to Boston, United States. He was not the captain or the second officer, as these are referred to in the postcards. He refers to somebody, possibly a son in Australia, as Jack. He refers to his wife, always as my darling girly. He had a friend on the SS Kalulu. He may have been in charge of the offloading of cargo or the engines, and he bought his wife a trinket made of seeds and a table centerpiece while overseas. Perhaps they're still in the family. Uh, She says that she can be contacted via her blog. It's Genealogy Boomerangs. If any of you out there, this strikes a chord with you, if it sounds a little familiar, or you have some ideas on how she might figure out how to get these letters back to this original family, get in touch with her genealogy boomerangs. She says, any help you can give would be appreciated. And thanks again for the great podcast. I love hearing all about your travels and experiences. Well, this is really cool. This is another example of um, somebody, you know, paying it forward. And we've, we've talked about that here a lot in the show and how cool when, when you guys are out there and you spot something, uh, you pick it up and, and make an effort like this, this is really going to make somebody's day when we get these letters back to the right people. And of course, if that happens, uh, email me too. copy me in the email. I want to hear about it. (laughs) And I want to report back here on the podcast that there was a happy ending. Oh!
Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage. Now, I know that you tune in to the Genealogy Gems podcast because you know that I'm going to carefully vet the products that come across my desk. And I'm only going to bring to this show the ones that I really think are the real gems. Well, MyHeritage.com is in that category, and I couldn't be happier that they've signed on to support and sponsor this free podcast. I've spent the last several months really digging into my heritage, and I found some powerful tools that I think you really need in your genealogy tool belt. First of all, they have over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, my heritage is the place that you want to be. Get your tree posted on their website and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees. Then there's My Heritage's unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. It constantly calls 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It's also the first to translate names between languages. So visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait, and there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. I've got some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available, and it offers some of the most customer-requested features, like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages, plus dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to rootsmagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. As I told you at the top of the show, when I was uh, speaking recently at the Mid-Continent Library in Independence, Missouri, I had an opportunity to go to dinner that evening and was sitting next to Beth Folk. And it turns out she's an expert in the area that I really know not too much about, which is Colonial America Genealogical Research. And uh, I was fascinated and, and felt like I was just so lucky to get kind of a tutorial there at dinner about that whole time frame and what was going on behind the scenes and the kinds of records that are available. And I asked her if she would come on the show and she said she would. Now the music that you're hearing is from that time frame, uh, early American colonial music. And actually this is called The Death of Wolf. It comes from earlyamerica.com. And um, I got their permission to use it here on the podcast. They were very gracious. And I want to encourage you, go visit them just to learn about early America, colonial times in general, and specifically their music collection. 
earlyamerica.com slash music. Uh, in fact, if you head to the show notes, I've even got the lyrics for this song, uh, The Death of General Wolf. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let's get a solid foundation on colonial America and the kinds of records and research that we can do. I'm Lisa, tickled to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. As I said, I am no expert in colonial research, I fully admit it. And, you know, the good news is, of course, we can't be experts in everything, but there's always somebody out there who really knows their stuff. And I could tell by talking to you on this topic that you certainly do. Tell us first and foremost, though, you do have a website. You're, how, what's your involvement in genealogy in general in the community? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, I have been doing genealogy since 1998 and have been actively helping others with their research and professionally speaking for about five years. You can learn more about me and what I do and my expertise at my website, which is genealogydecoded.com. There you'll also find my blog, which has a lot of colonial references and a lot of material and supporting data for what we're going to talk about today, including tons of bibliographies. And then you'll also find my resources section, which has free downloadable good stuff. Oh, we love that. Okay, wonderful. And I'll, of course, have um, the link to her website in our show notes so that you guys can just click right through. Um, Let's head back. And we're going to head all the way back to England. Um, because that's kind of where all this starts. Um, what is daily life like back in urban England that kind of created um, this influx of immigrants to America? Great question. Um, the period that we're talking about is 1600 to 1750, which we know is colonial America. The situation that evolved or brought forth the topic we're going to talk about today, which is indenture and convicts being sent to America, is that things were not so great. The king had some very interesting, if you want to put it that way, rules and regulations that he was trying to enforce social norms, one of which was that he had this very bizarre migration policy. I suspect that you have most often or most likely moved at some point in your life. Well, the king wasn't real fond of people moving. He wanted people to be born in one community, which could be a very small rural area, and then live and die and work there. You were not allowed to move. So Lisa asked about London. So say you couldn't get a job in your small town community and you wanted to move to London to get a job because we know or the perception at the time was London was paved with golden streets and it was the land of milk and honey, far from it in reality. What you would end up doing is being caught up by literally the parish carts. Parish carts were a colonial England paddy wagon. If you were caught outside of your home community, you would be scooped up and sent back home. So that was his way. Oh my of keeping, gosh. Truly. So that was his way of keeping under control his vision of London. The reality was that life was very tough. Um, there were beggars and prostitutes and trash in the streets and fluid um, sewage, if you will. It was a very rough environment. And so getting work even at the time, even if you were from London, was very difficult. And what was his far. motivation in this, in, in keeping people in one spot? So they could um, swarm London and make it easy. Uh, and, there was, and there just wasn't that expansion out into the countryside of, of the available work. What a, what a terrible challenge to be stuck in one place and there's nowhere to make a living. Indeed, it was an agrarian society outside of London. So if your father or your uncle owned the land, which he probably did for a hundred years, and you're the fourth son and the eldest son inherits all, you're kind of out of luck. Right, exactly. So they're looking for work. They're thinking there was all this great stuff going on in London. But of course, London is uh, not what it's all cracked up to be. Exactly. Um, and there were there was the Great Fire. Did that have a big impact on on some of this 
you know, moving around and, and wanting to get out of the country altogether? Uh, the Great Fire of 1665 in London really just destroyed uh, London. Think of the Chicago Fire, yeah. um, Mrs. O'Leary's Cow, the earthquake in San Francisco. It was an urban society that was not adept to managing <laughs> a wood structure fire that devastated <laughs> yeah. everything. And so it made it even more slum ridden and more destitute. So all of this is leading to, obviously, looking for a change. Now, the, the king is saying, we don't want you going anywhere. How did people end up coming to colonial America, and particularly in that capacity as an indentured servant? Excellent question. What happened is it really stemmed, it seems like such an anomaly to us. We would never think of hiring or indenturing a servant today. You know, it's very much in our minds akin to slavery. It's just, though I admit there's probably places in the world that do do this, we don't imagine that in 21st century America. Right. But in their world, it wasn't such a stretch of the imagination. Times were tough. You didn't have a lot of options. And further, there was a very accepted cultural norm of an apprenticeship. Okay, because, say, you're the fourth son and the eldest son inherited the land. One of your options was to find a tradesman, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, if you will, and apprentice to him. And the rules were that you live in his loft, barn, whatever, the lesser accommodations. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker will feed you and house you. And you work for him for free for seven years learning his trade. You learn how to be a baker or butcher or candlestick maker. And then at that end of that seven years, you have an apprenticed trade and you can become a journeyman and go on about making a very respectable living. So this was very much done. It was very much a cultural norm. So it wasn't that far of a stretch to go to the mindset of an indentured servant, which instead of being taught a trade, you're given free, quote unquote, passage to America. And then you come to America and you work for someone for whom has either paid your way himself, say a farmer or a blacksmith in Philadelphia that paid his way or paid your way to America, and you work for that blacksmith or farmer for seven years, unpaid, and at the end of the seven years, you get in compensation, this is cute, you get tools, 50 acres of land, and two suits. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Two suits. That's the rule. Did it always happen? Heavens to Betsy, no, because the indentured servant was not really in a position to negotiate. <laughs> I've earned right. seven years worth of free labor, and I'm taking your word that you're going to pay up. Okay. So that would be one way. Or the other way, which was often happened, is the ship captains, who were not always the most scrupulous, would either induce or collect young men and women who volunteered or were, okay, the word is spiriting, but ostensibly kidnapped. Right. They would pay the wage, the ship captains would pay the cost of the wage to bear the cost to bring them to America. And then when they got to the port of Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, they would have an auction. And they would sell off the young people to the farmers who knew the game, if you will, and would buy up these young workers for their farms and the ship captain would make money. Was that still on that seven-year agreement? Because, boy, that starts looking like downright slavery, doesn't it? It does. And seven was common, though, you know, five years is not uncommon. Oh, (laughs) heavens, if you were a woman. Marriages Mm -hmm. were prohibited, just like in slavery. You could not marry if you were an indentured servant because you needed to keep your mind on your work, and it just gets Uh complicated. But it happened, or more often, there were um, non-sanctified relationships under which people became illegitimate children. Right. Further, heavens, if the woman, because we know it's all her fault, got pregnant and had a child, That was a big no-no. And she would have to do extra time for her child. Wow. And, of course, who's going to believe or, you know, prove whether something is rape or whether it's consensual? What a way to be able to keep them trapped. Well, indeed, and odds are pretty good that the father was the owner. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's interesting in what little reading, you know, I was able to kind of put together before we got together on this call to talk. 
I was reading that oftentimes there was actually some built-in motivation for the um, owners in America to actually treat their slaves, the slaves that were coming from Africa, almost better than the ones, the white slaves that were coming from England, because they were not going to be long-term property. Oh, absolutely. Because the big distinction, aside from the racial and the port of nativity between slavery and what I'm calling white slavery, which is Uh the indenture and the convicts, is the fact that it's a lifetime investment. With the indentures, you only get them for seven years. With the slaves, it's lifetime and generational. So you're not so concerned about what their condition is at the end of the seven years. No. I mean, what a, it's, a, it's a horrible outcome for everyone involved. But, you know, I'm sure for some people, the desperation was truly worth the risk. But it sounds like even with the ship captain um, selling them when they get there, mm-hmm. boy, that's even a little more risky because they really don't know who they're going to end up with or where in the world they're going to end up, right? From the perspective of the indentured. The indentured, uh-huh. Yes. I, yeah, you have no idea. Well, and the mortality rate was huge, up to 50%. For men and 35% for women. Okay, what does that say about women? We are weaker sex. Um, Yeah, and so the ship captains, um, it was very much a business. It was very much, as we would see it, cold-hearted. They had their business calculus that they could lose a bunch of people and still make a profit because the margins were so high. The cost to ship someone to America was roughly five pounds, but you could make 25 pounds on a young strapping man that could be good labor or a young woman who could, you know, um, breed more, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, when you read about this, we see the term indentured and we see bondage. Mm -hmm. Will you differentiate that for us or are they one and the same? How, How do we interpret these terms when we come across them in records? Excellent question. The difference is significant. Indenture is what we've been talking about. You either um, sign up uh, personally or willfully. Um, I want to go to America. I can't afford it. I'm going to have somebody else pay my fee, and I know what's waiting for me. Or I get scooped up, kidnapped, spirited. Bondage is the British term for convict. Okay, Convict okay. and bondage are interchangeable. Um, And you will see a lot of the British records use the term bondage because it comes from British documents or the British Mm -hmm. compilers or the British authors because that's what the term they use in in their version of the National Archives, which is the Public Records Office. Would you like me to tell you about the convicts? Yes, please do. Because now there's one. <laughs> we actually have one of those in my husband's family. So yes, let's let's hear about this. Um, and and what the difference is? What's their their situation versus okay, an their story? All right. So, do you, are you familiar with the play Les Misérables? Uh, a bit. Yes. Okay. The hero in Les Misérables is named Jean Valjean, and mm-hmm. he's the young man who, in the opening scene, it, it's in France, but it's very much a parallel is caught for stealing bread to feed his family, okay? And the penalty was, in our humble opinion, or what we would see in the 21st century, just outrageously egregious. It was seven years or 10 years or lifetime for stealing bread to feed his family, okay? Exactly the same thing would happen in England. If you can't get work, you're in London, you're in Bristol, Liverpool, you're in the slums, you're trying to feed your family or just survive yourself. And so petty theft and prostitution was absolutely rampant. Mm -hmm. So instead of instituting um, social relief or creating an economy that generated more jobs, the king just decided to fill up the jails. Well, okay. You're thinking, oh my goodness, now you've, now he's got a problem. He's got right. these people who, and you have to realize that at this time, petty theft, prostitution, these sort of things were seen as a deficit of moral character. It was mm-hmm. not seen as a means to an end to feed yourself as we would now. Okay. So these people who are less than moral character are now filling up the jails and the king's got a problem. Okay, I can either build more jails, I can change the laws, I can institute social relief. I've got an idea, says the king. I will ship them to America. 
Okay. Ah, and of course, we often hear of convicts going to Australia. So it's just export them out. Well, indeed. And we know where Australia started. It was a penal colony. The reason Australia started as a penal colony is because we decided to declare our independence, have a revolution, kick the king out, and he <laughs> had no place to send his convicts. Wow. So he's just shopping around. <laughs> okay. So so first, they're coming to America. And um, what's he just filling up the boats? How's this working? Okay. Here's what happens. He finds a industrious, enterprising group of entrepreneurs who have experience in shipping people across the Atlantic. Who might those be, Lisa? Oh, right. The slave traders. Bingo. The slave traders are coming from Africa to America. Then they don't want a deadhead. If you're familiar with transportation, which means go somewhere with an empty load. It's not productive. It's not Uh lucrative. Um, Then they end up deadheading back to Europe or Africa with an empty load, and that's expensive. So what they do is they fill up the boats with wet, rotting, stinky tobacco or wet, rotting, stinky cotton, all right, or animals. Then they take these ships back to England and empty them. These are wooden ships that have now been on the ocean for three months full of stinking, rotten tobacco. They pull up to the ports, and the king let's the captain have, oh, let's say 100 or 200 convicts that he has deemed worthy or has sentenced to, quote, transportation, that was the sentence. Instead of getting probation or 10 years or life or whatever, it was transportation. That was considered the lenient, genial, kinder thing than just to leave them rotten in the the jails. So Uh the king would give them a boatload, literally, of passengers that would now spend three months on board on a wooden ship with cattle under deck in a boat that has just been on the ship on the seas with tobacco for three months. Wow. This is not a Disney cruise. Uh. Okay. So then the ship captains full of these convicts and men and women, young and old. I've seen a case study of a young girl who was 12 years old, who was caught stealing a diamond ring And, quote, unquote, the the court had pity on her, so they sentenced her to transportation and shipped her to America to work in the plantations. Twelve years old. Wow. So the ship captain, full of his cargo, literally cargo, and that's why I, I teach a class on this, and it's called Imported to America. And the term is used deliberately because we think of things being imported as property, wine, cheese, cars. They thought of him the same way. They were property. Brings him to the coast. He shoots. He's like at Charleston or one of the Carolinas, Virginia, or Maryland uh, ports, because that's where most of them went. Um, And I can explain why here in a second. So they pull up to the ports, and they shoot off the gun. And that's kind of like the alarm that says, y'all come. So then the plantation owners who need good, cheap, free labor – just like the slaves, to work on the tobacco and cotton farms, come down to the port. The ship captains, the ship captains gussy them up. Okay, they've been through hell and back, but they want to make their property look good for sale. And they have an auction, just like a slave auction. And I saw this most priceless quote where the ship captain is talking about this event. And he goes, and it's a Sunday afternoon and it is lovely and we are serving punch. Oh, my word. Serving punch while they're human trafficking. Yeah, like it's a cotillion or something. Indeed, it's lovely. Oh, good. We're going to be selling them off. And so the (sighs) plantation owners buy them just like slaves, and they trade them. They become property just like slaves. Um, They deed them. If your seven years is not up, and this applies for indenture also, if your seven years or whatever your transportation is up and the boss dies, (laughs) you're not out of luck you get inherited to the next generation until your term is done. Traded with cattle in some kind of farm deal. And then they serve on the plantations doing exactly what the African Americans were doing. It's incredible. I'm assuming we're talking 1600s. We're getting into the early 1700s. Does any of this ever get regulated? And when does it stop? Okay. Uh, The second question is the first question. The practice of indentures wound up around 1820. 
So if your ancestor came to America circa before 1820, there's a really, really good chance three out of four were indentured. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, convicts ended with the revolution because we got tired of taking the king's convicts and he went on to um, Australia to continue the trade for a while. Uh In terms of regulation, it was initially started as a black market business. The king was, you know, just like, shh, shh, here, here, um, African ship captains, here, have the the convicts and do with them what you will, out of sight, out of mind. Um, After a while, and honestly, I don't recall what brought it up, but at 1718, they passed the Transportation Act, which was the first attempt to bring this out of the shadows and have some some modicum of humanity. Um, And what they instituted was threefold. Number one, they determined who could be shipped. And it was a list of crimes for which you could be shipped to America, um, such as anything less than treason, highway robbery, literally highway robbery, um, arson, uh, murder. And if you had committed witchcraft, you could not be shipped to America. But again, so it's it's still considered the lesser crimes, I think is what you're saying. Is that right? Yes, indeed. How are the conditions comparing? If you stay in a jail in England versus if you get on the ship, who do you who do you think has the worst situation? Honestly, my vote would be if I was in the situation, 12 years old young girl, not not so much, but if I was a young man who was 20 years old, honestly, I wouldn't have I would have taken the the behind door number two, go to America. At least you have a chance for a life afterwards. A future, exactly. If you did your time in England, the situation is still the same. You're going to come out of the jail. You're still going to be stealing. They're still going to put you in jail and around and around and around you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wanted to go back to the Transportation Act. Yes. There was Mm -hmm. some some modicum. So it was one of the things, who could be shipped, the other was that there had to be a surgeon on board, okay, some hint of civil medical care so that if a woman was having a child on board or if someone got horribly sick, you know, it wouldn't be just a matter of your death sentence and they throw you overboard. And then the third thing was the amount of convicts or people that they could put on board. And it made it to where the maximum was the four people standing in the area that we would now call a queen size bed. So wow. That's pretty tight and that's that's the improvement. This is not all out of the goodness of their heart because they also want cargo, if you will, yes. showing up in reasonable shape. Indeed, indeed, it's all profit incentive. It's very yeah. much entrepreneurial, business minded. Yeah, it's cargo. So this happens in 1718. By the early 1800s, we see that this is coming to an end. What's what's causing it to to finally kind of wrap up? I think it's cultural mindset changing. You know, Uh 1820 ish is when indenture winds down. By 1860, we're having the Civil War over slavery. It's just a mindset changing. So, if we've identified. And here's one of the key questions, I think, for for those of us who are looking through our records and we're saying, well, I've got ancestors that I know I've traced back to during this time frame. Mm-hmm. Beth, where are they going to see some sort of an indication that says they're in a bondage situation, they're in an indentured situation? Excellent question. And there are. And I can give you a couple of hints that might give you ways to point to them. Um the best record that I would strongly recommend anyone to go check out, even if you're just voyeuristically interested in this and you don't think your family was related at all, is a website called the Old Bailey Online.org. O L D B A I L E Y O N L I N E.org. What this is, is the good people of England have scoured the court records for this time and put up full transcripts of every court hearing done in all of the courts during this time period. So you can actually get the transcripts of what your ancestor may have gone through and or been sentenced to. And it's an amazing database that you can sort by sentence, So if you type in or choose the term transportation, which would be someone shipped to America, 
it will pull up close to 40,000 court records for people who were transported to America. If you weren't transported to America and may have just gotten in trouble, it would also pull up records or the court hearing for any other sentence, uh, witchcraft, high treason, uh, robbery, prisoner of war, any of those sort of things. And it's all free. It's absolutely free. And it's a beautiful database, easy to navigate. Wonderful. Additionally, you can find all sorts of records um, for runaways, just like slaves, indentureds and convicts weren't thinking this was the funnest place ever and right. would like to go home or would like to be out of this less than positive environment because it was hard work and I'm sure they weren't treated well, men and women. Right. So you want to look to the newspapers of the time or books that were transcripts. People, scholars have gone through the newspapers and have abstracted runaway notices, which are fabulous because not only they give you your ancestor's name and the situation, but oftentimes they include a physical description. And at this time where there's no photographs, wouldn't you love to know that your ancestor was Irish, red hair, freckled, of lean form, and was wearing a blue coat with buttons when last seen? Wow. <laughs> but that seems like it would be, um, I mean, it's somewhat of a needle in a haystack in terms of, you know, getting through the newspapers are, you said that there might be some books with transcribed newspapers that focus on this colonial time frame. Mm -hmm. The Holy Grail is an author named Wilson, Coldham, C-O-L-D-H-A-M. He is the preeminent or authority and has spent more than 15 years in the bowels of the public records office in England, which is England's National Archives. And right. he has called it for this very purpose and written all sorts of books on immigrants to America, convicts to America, bondage to America. Not to do a, a, a plug, but I have lots of bibliographies for all of this on my blog. Wonderful. No, that's that's a wonderful resource. And that's kind of what we're looking for is how to, to really narrow it in because it, it could – feel very vast oh, and you know how to approach these records are there records that we're going to see once they get here yes um that that might say ah this is how he got here this is what his original situation is even if they're out of it at that point um yes and no you will be the most lucky person on earth if you find a contract they really don't exist for a number of reasons number one the people for the most part were illiterate and number two if you were an indentured servant would you keep the contract in your scrapbook Right, right. Probably not. Right. Um, but what you will find is in just your normal record groups, land records, probate records, deed records, um, church records, you will find references to servant. Mm -hmm. And though that's not golden that says he was an indentured servant, he could have been a paid servant. It's a really good hint. Um then in terms of convicts, there's a couple clues. Um, if you are doing your research and say you're in a 1790 census or one of the early Pennsylvania septennial censuses, Pennsylvania did their own censuses on every seven years, uh -huh. and you find that your ancestor is the only one in that community with that last name or maybe one or the other, that they may probably did not come with family Right. That's a good clue that they may have been a convict. Exactly. And that could lead us to then looking for exactly. other records. It's interesting because, you know, when we're going through 19th century census records, for example, we'll also, you know, often see the term servant mm -hmm. as their occupation. Mm -hmm. But what a different meaning it has, when you, you know, a century earlier. Um, and making sure that as a genealogist, whether we're, we're new, we've been at it for a while, that terminology evolves too and it can really mean something so totally different and point you to a completely different record set absolutely i wanted to throw in i mentioned illiterate there is a unique group of convicts that were sent to america that were political prisoners you go and have a war on scotland you get a whole bunch of military um officers you don't have room in the jails for them keeping them is expensive so let's ship them to america if by 
you're in that lucky descendant pool, you may be fortunate enough to find a diary or a transcript because odds are pretty good that they were literate. And it is from their records that we really know about the conditions and the experience. Again, most were illiterate and wouldn't want to document it anyway. Right, right. Put it behind them and and have that new life in a new country. Which is not hugely unusual. I know my grandparents came... um, my grandparents spoke German and never talked about Germany or the old country because they wanted to become Anglicanized. They wanted to be part of the new world. So it's not uncommon just for a general immigrant wanting to put it behind them, let alone somebody who had a, well, not so fun past. Absolutely. That's certainly how it was with my great grandparents. Do you find yourself, I'm just interested from your perspective, you know, we go through parts of history where we're doing research on our family and we say, we almost really can't even fathom mm-hmm. what people felt, how they responded. Sure, it sounds horrific, you know, but everything was so different. Absolutely. How do you cope with that sense of, in a sense, judgment, but also just, uh, you know, the feeling of, oh, my gosh, we were the owners or we were the slaves or the indentured, whatever. Um, how do you cope with that as you're working through your research? That's a great question. It's a, it's a bimodal or a bifurcated response in my I can't help but feel judgmental. It's like, oh, my gosh, what were you thinking? You know, it's just so mm-hmm. important. And I find myself being very voyeuristic about it. It's like watching a train wreck through history. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know how the story ends. On the other hand, I do try my best to set it aside and say, you know, they did the best they could with the environment they had, you know, self-indenture. I get it. You had no other options. It sounded like a good deal at the time. I do marketing by day. Somebody had been selling this as America, the land of milk and honey. Oh, seven years. It's no big deal. You'll be 20 when you're done and you go on and you live your life. And it was a free opportunity and no other option was available. Yeah. Absolutely. I know in my husband's great grandfather's case, uh, he did a seven year a- apprenticeship mm-hmm. with a blacksmith in England. So he got the good side of that deal where there was actually a tradesman with a very profitable trade who took a, a young boy of 13 and said, OK, we'll do this for seven years. And he got to stay near family and sure. and create a career. But if that just was not in the cards, you had to do something. Absolutely. How incredible. It makes you realize just how strong, resilient, uh, brave, you know, Amazing. all of these like, people were. It's like the immigrant story on steroids. I'm fascinated yeah. by the immigrant story. I could not walk from St. Joseph, Missouri to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. I could not be on a boat for three months coming overseas with the 50% mortality rate. It would just, I'd be looking for the hairdryer, you know. <laughs> you know, it, no matter where our folks come from, the fact that we're standing here today means yeah. they were something else, you know, and Absolutely. enduring all the more if they were indentured, I would think. What a, an amazing thing to be proud that they survived it and Absolutely. and created families beyond then. Well, even just to come to America by yourself because all of them did. No, yeah. no support group, no community in which you necessarily spoke the language, introduced to a world and a climate. I mean, think about going from urban London to Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh Just the geotemporal change. Oh, my word. The more you describe that experience, the more we can kind of see um, the makeup of America today Mm -hmm. and just um, our sense of independence and entrepreneurial spirit and willingness to go for it and that kind of thing. Things that we're kind of all stereotypically known for um, has origins in some very difficult times, but obviously some Some good qualities came out at all that. Indeed. Um, I was talking to a couple psychologist friends of mine just the other day, and they are working on a new class called Culture in Psychology and how the experiences, why I was brought into the conversation was an understanding of how the experiences of our ancestors shape our own mindset. Mm -hmm. And if my ancestor was an immigrant in the normal conventional terms or even more so in these terms, I cannot imagine that independent survival, make your own way mindset would not translate down through the generations. Yeah, it's funny. I was actually just thinking about this uh, last night, thinking of, you know, trying to kind of visualize my great grandmother. And she just came over in 1910. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that long ago. And it's one thing when we look at our documents. But if you just close your eyes, 
and visualize, okay, she's getting on the boat. Well, wait a second. She's got a four-year-old holding on to her hand. I don't always think about that when I look at the paper. Yeah. You know? Oh, she's three months pregnant. <gasps> okay. okay. You know what? Her husband went three months before, and my first thought was, why is she just leaving three months after him when she finds out she's pregnant? Uh-huh. It's got to be. So – now I'm trying to visualize myself at her age and I'm holding the four-year-old and I'm pregnant and probably in my first trimester of nauseousness yes. and getting on the ship. But it's not just that. Then they get off and where do they, they go and how are they getting there? Are they getting on a train? Are they getting on a boat? I mean, when you really walk through it and, and do that visualization process, it uh, – brings a whole nother level of <laughs> respect. And, and I realize now why there's such a tough streak in, in the women in our family because uh, she and she went all the way eventually ended up in California. Oh. Look at the world traveling of some of these people. Oh my gosh. Uh, many of us have never traveled as much as, as our ancestors did. Oh my gosh. Let alone in the means. It's yeah. Good yeah. grief. Fascinating. Well, this is all wonderful. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to bring all of us up to speed because, you know, everybody's in varying degrees of where they are in their research and where they are in their familiarity with history. And this is such a critical point. And I think for many of us, we know it's going to happen. Eventually, we're going to need to delve into this time frame and these records. And um, to know now that when we see a term like servant, we're not just seeing uh, the housekeeping girl, you yes. know, who lives upstairs. <laughs> We're seeing people in a whole different situation. And, and uh, Beth, I think that you've also really given us the parameters so that we know what kind of records we're looking for, what the meanings are, and that there are such incredible resources. Who would think for activities that happened so long ago that something like Old Bailey's is on, online? That's just amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's just tremendous resources out there. Yeah. Tell us again your website. And I want to let you guys all know that uh, Beth does re- regional speaking engagements. She's from the Midwest. So if you're in a society out there and, and would love to have this topic on your calendar, uh, she would be a wonderful person to get in touch with that you can do through her website. And of course, she also does genealogy uh, research as well. But Beth, tell us how we can get in touch with you. Lisa, thank you. Uh, my website again is genealogy decoded dot com all one word and i have a blog out there and i would again encourage you to go to the section on the blog one of the categories called indenture and convicts i probably have at least 20 posts up there each with bibliographies and pointed to specific um, websites that will give you all sorts of great information and if you have any questions you're more than welcome to email me my email's on the website but it's also Beth at genealogydecoded.com. And Lisa, thank you so much. I've just enjoyed this tremendously. Thank you again. Thank you. And uh, so wonderful to get a chance to meet you in person uh, at the Midwest Center. And I know our paths will cross again. Thank you again, Beth. Thank you. Have a super day. Profile America, Saturday, May 24th. In a way, today marks the 170th birthday of the World Wide Web, only it was electromechanical, not digital. On this date, in 1844, Samuel F.B. Morse activated the first telegraph line, sending a dots and dashes code message from the U.S. Capitol building to a receiver in Baltimore. The ability of the telegraph to communicate quickly over long distances of land made it an immediate success. By the late 1850s, the first telegraph cable had been laid across the Atlantic Ocean, and in 1861, the telegraph spanned the continental United States. Over the ensuing decades, the wires wrapped around the world. From the 1844 demonstration, telecommunications today has grown into a $563 billion a year industry and employs nearly 1.1 million workers. Profile America is in its 17th year as a public service of the U.S. Census Bureau. 
Thanks so much for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 167. It just flew by. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Beth. And even if you're not currently immersed in colonial research, hopefully this is just one that you can tuck in your back pocket, because at some point that may come into your family tree, and I hope that it pays off. Before I wrap up here, I want to share a little something. In the February 2014 newsletter, um, I shared a video where I was explaining why I do family history. And I asked all of you to share what motivates you uh, on the Genealogy Gems podcast Facebook page. And you can like us over there at facebook.com slash genealogy gems. And I wanted to share with you just some of uh, the reasons why your fellow listeners are doing family history. Paul wrote, to start with, my aunt gave me 2000 plus names when I was baptized, as she knew the church members do a lot of genealogy. And many of the stories I found were interesting. But I also got to know my father who was killed about seven months before I was born. So uh, that was his uh, motivation in pursuing and, and learning more in family history. Tim wrote in says just the whole destiny thing. When I go back several generations, I wonder if he had never married her, what if she had not moved to this town, met her husband, what if they had stopped having kids just before my great, great, great grandfather was born, etc. I am who I am and where I am because of decisions that were made long ago, just kind of cool. And Margaret uh, said that she pursues her family history because Uh, She says, I want to take myself back to their time, find out what their lives were like, follow their journeys, trials, tribulations, and day-to-day lives through the census records, city directories, and Sanborn maps. I discovered my second great-grandpa lived around the corner from an ice cream store in Savannah with a dairy right behind it. How cool is that? And Peter wrote, I do research because I want to know who my family is, where they came from, and what they did. After a 20 year search to solve one of my family lines missing links, I solved it and I yelled, woohoo! It felt so rewarding. And Margaret says, my mother had always described herself as a Heinz 57. I'm much more curious about what and who had contributed to who I am. Having roots that reach into ancestors from Germany, England, Mexico, and Spain by ways of Rhode Island, Indiana, Texas, and California just make for interesting research. I couldn't agree more, you guys. Thank you so much for sharing on the Genealogy Gems Facebook page and uh, for subscribing to the newsletter. And thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.